Okay, now I'm going to talk about what I call the three pillars of the Ries profile. These are the three ideas that make the Ries profile unique. One of the titles, subtitles of my uh, book is The Normal Personality, and the subtitle is A New Way of Thinking. These three ideas is what gives us the new way of thinking. Each may be unique to the Reese profile. Each one. And of course, all three in combination make the Reese profile very different. So we're going to talk about how this is different from the way everyone else thinks about motivation, especially with motivation and personality. And the three ideas are, first, that we did a scientific identification of needs. There have been many theories of needs over the last hundred and some years. And this the Reese profile is the only one that develop the theory of needs, define needs by asking other people, by doing it in a scientific way. Second, we connected motivation to personality through a concept of motivational priority that I'll be talking about. As far as I can tell, the concept of motivational priority is completely unique to the Reese profile. Uh, it contradicts significant portions of psychology. Uh, you can't find that idea, I don't think, anywhere. And it, it is, the extent to which we have to explain ourselves, that is the idea that is really a gap between us and the way we think and uh, the way traditional personality theory thinks. And I'll talk about that. And the third pillar is connecting motives to relationships. The Reese profile is very unusual. Others have talked about motivation and personality, not the way the Reese profile does, but they, they notice that motives and personality are connected. But this also connects the trait to relationships, all kinds of relationships. So that's the three pillars. What is a need? A need is a universal goal. It is something that motivates everyone. It's the whole species, all human beings, care about this goal. That's called the need in psychology. Okay, so we have this idea that there are certain goals that motivate everybody. Well, what are they? And if we're going to understand people in terms of universal goals or needs, well, then the next logical step what are these goals and needs? What does motivate everybody? And from that we go, how are we going to figure this out? How are we going to answer, go about answering this question? There are five criteria. It's called construct validity, measurement reliability, social desirability, and current validity, and criterion validity. In order to have a scientifically valid list of needs, you have to have all five criteria satisfied. All right, so what we did with the uh, 16 needs is the first and only list of universal goals that was scientifically developed. We went out and we asked people, said, well, if we want to know what are the goals everyone shares, why don't we ask people what their goals are and find out which are the ones common, find out what they are. We started with every goal we could think of. We had 500 and some of these goals. And we asked diverse groups of people if these goals are important to them, if they motivate them. And from that, that's where the 16 needs came from. It came from mathematical analysis of what people said. This is the only list of needs, only list of the universal motives, based on what people told us, based on what people say motivates. It's the only one that was developed scientifically. So as you know, we have 16 needs. Um, acceptance, which is a desire to not be criticized or fail. Curiosity, the desire to, for understanding. 
eating, the desire for food, family, which is basically about parenting, honor, the desire for uh, morality. Now, thinking of honor, it may make sense to someone that the need for family, or people who we call higher family, are very devoted to their parents. If you look at the Reese profile, we have one desire for how devoted you are to your parents, which is honor. And one for how devoted you are to your children, which is family. Why? Because they're uncorrelated. There are lots of people who are totally devoted to their parents who don't care about their children. And there are lots of people who are devoted to their children and don't particularly care about their parents. And you have to have separate motives or you end up lumping those two examples as the same thing. Idealism, the desire for social justice. Independence, the desire for self-reliance. Order, the desire for structure. The remaining eight desires, physical activity, power, how much you desire power in the race profile tells us how much you want to work. Uh, romance, Savings, the desire to collect. And the last four are social contact, uh, status. How much you desire status tells us how much attention you want. Tranquility and vengeance. That, that is the list of 16 needs. Now, because of the way it was developed, pretty much all motives should be uh, one or more of these 16 needs. I don't want to say that no one will ever think of a 17th need. But it's pretty darn hard. This is comprehensive. So some of the common questions are, what about seeking wealth? Where's that in the 16 desires? The most common motive for wanting to be wealthy is status. If you're rich, you're respected. And you're paid attention to. Whereas creativity on the list. Creativity isn't the motive. And it isn't universally uh, valued. So the first pillar of the Reese Profile, the first thing that makes us really different, is that we define motives and purpose. We have, I think, the best, by far, the best definition of motives, what of each motive. The criterion of construct validity. We're the only list of motives that has been a subject to successfully and repeatedly confirmatory factor analysis. That is the conventional acceptance of construct validity. Reliability. The test three, test reliability of the risk profile uh, scales are comparable to personality tests. I think slightly better than the MMDR. Social desirability. That's the extent to which people are just answering questions because they think it'll make them look good. It's lower than a lot of personality tests, which is good. Concurrent validity. This is the extent to which the Reese profile results predict the results of other psychological measures that we know are valid. Reese profile predicts measures the Big Five personality test, Meyer Briggs, and a dozen other tests. So we have concurrent validity. And criterion validity. Do we predict behavior in the real world? And the answer, I think, is, well, certainly we have studies that show we do. We predict choice of college majors, TA, television viewing habits, uh, aspects of religion, how religious someone is, athletic performance, uh, grades in school, stuff like that. So this shows the test is, in fact, uh, valid. But I think the Reese profile, someone who someday does a study will show, it's one of the few things in all of psychology that predict anything. Prediction is our strength. So the first pillar of the Reese profile is the empirical definition. Now the second pillar, the one in which we're really unique, is the concept of priority. Okay, throughout all of social science, in the culture, in the field, everywhere you look, a motive is something people want. And when they get it, the motive is satisfied. You're hungry, you eat, you're not hungry anymore. That's how everyone thinks about it. You're lonely, you 
socialize, you're not lonely anymore. The Reese profile has a very different notion. These motives don't go away, they come back. You're hungry, you eat, you're not hungry. Yeah, but come back a little bit. You know, come back five hours from now, and guess what? The person's hungry again. Come back a day later after they socialize and they were satisfied, and guess what? They're lonely again. Universal motives, universal motives, need. Those things everyone cares about. They turn on, they turn off, they turn on, they turn off from across the life cycle. From age 10, 11, all the way until the person dies. There's nothing in psychology, there's nothing in social science that has that notion that, that the motive is to keep coming back. And it's crucial because it doesn't come back at the same rate. It comes back much faster for some people than for others. If you have a strong appetite and you eat, and someone else has a very weak appetite and also eats and both they have lunch together, the person with the strong appetite is hungry quicker. The hunger comes back quicker than with the person with the weak appetite. So if the motive is strong, it comes back quicker and it's harder to satiate. Right? So this is, this is an idea that is completely unique to the Reef profile. That's obviously true. It's obvious that these motives come and go once you think about it. And so we have the principle, everybody embraces all 16 desires. These are universal goals. They motivate everybody, but they don't motivate everybody in the same way. The fact that they're universal means they're important. They're important, but they're not the same for everybody. People ignore them. The Reese Profile is about individuality, and this is the concept of priorities. The concept that universal traits are prioritized differently. Okay, so we are individuals to a much greater extent than, than is often realized. Uh, for sake of simplicity, we recognize we just have three different priorities. We have a high, we have low, and we have average. High is the upper twenty percent, low is the bottom twenty percent, and uh, the rest is the middle sixty percent. Uh, we made an assumption that culture satisfies an average need. You don't have to do anything gratify an average need. If you have an average degree of curiosity, oh, you'll be bombarded with information and learning and news and conversation, and that will satisfy an average degree of curiosity. If you have a high need for curiosity, well, now this is unusual. You have to go out of your way to satisfy it. And what, what, what will you do? You will probably read a lot of books, hang out at maybe universities, play intellectual games like bridge, do things that make you think. And what will happen? Other people will say, this person spends a lot of time thinking, that's an intellectual. The motive and the priority leads the personality. Suppose you have a low need for curiosity. Now you don't like to think. You say school is boring. So again, we talk about the priority. If you like to think a lot or if you like to think a little is what we focus on. So high and low needs determine personality, and average needs do not. And it's the concept of priority that allows the, us to connect the Reese profile desires to the uh, personality trait. So if you have a high need for acceptance, um, you're going to be very insecure. You're going to be seeking reassurance. You're going to be asking people to accept you. You're going to be needing approval. And people are going to say, well, you're insecure. If you have a low need, you won't be. You'll, you'll be noticeably avoid not caring if people approve of you or criticize you. And people will say you're insecure. If you have a high need for status, you'll be formal. You may be attention seeking. You may value fame because that produces high status. That's what you want. 
It's not status that, that satisfies you. It's a lot of it. It's how much. And if you have, because status motivates everyone. The individual is about how much. And if you have a low need, you'll be informal. So the second pillar of the Reese Profile connects values, motives, and traits. The values are the priorities. The motives, 16. And when you put the values on the motives, and you prioritize the motives, we get traits. Now the third pillar of the Reese Profile is we connect these motives and traits to relationships. And we have, we have two principles here. One is the principle of self hygiene and the idea is that we think our values are best, not just for us, but for everybody. So people who have, they expect other people to appreciate their prioritizations. If you are high order, you'll be organized, and you expect people to appreciate that. If you are low order, you'll be disorganized. And you, you don't say, hey, I'm disorganized, what's wrong with me? You say, well, I'm a spontaneous person. I can handle a lot of things at the same time. All right? The only reason other people are organized is because they can't deal with lots of things at the same time, like me. You expect to be appreciated for it. Right? Um, and you go through life thinking there's something wrong with the organized person. You know, why don't they ease up? So the principle of self-hugging is that we each think that our values are best, not just for us, but for everyone. If you were, if you had my values, you would be happy. Is the way is the way we tend to think. And so that leads to everyday tyranny. If we love someone, we try to make them have our values. Oh, you're not organized? Let me make you organized. You don't like to, you don't like school? Well, you, should, you know, if you could become a lifelong learner, you would be happy. And what's amazing about, about this is the people who advocate this are not happy themselves. Uh, you have unhappy people telling, sometimes happy people, how to be happy. Parents tell their children what will make them happy. And spouses try to change their partners as to what would make them happy. And so we call this idea everyday tyranny, trying to change someone to conform to your values because you think it's for their good. And people, once they go down this path, they don't change very much. The, the basic idea, uh, the saver has never enjoyed spending. You're a saver, someone's a real saver. Every time you save, you like it. Makes you feel good. Every time you spend, makes you uncomfortable. But people believe their feelings above all else. So it seems obvious to you that saving is, is produces the best happiness. You don't think other people might be different. You think you've discovered something. I've discovered something. It's happiness comes from savings. And then you look at the spending and wonder what's wrong with this person for not having discovered how much more fun savings is. And so the saver tries to to change the spending. With the spenders, they were a little round. Never enjoy saving. I had lots of fun spending. Thinks the saver is in denial. You know, is, is, a, is embracing things that don't make them happy. All right, we said so you try to change other people. In relationships, all repeated quarrels, where you have, we tend to have the same quarrels over and over and over again. Those of you who have been married for a while, uh, or go to a parent child with your parents or with your children, um, you tend to have the exact same quarrel. You have a you quarrel with your parent over something, you've probably been quarreling, had that quarrel over and over again through much of your adult life. If you have a quarrel in your uh, marriage or relationship, long term relationship, the quarrel keeps recurring. You keep having the same quarrel uh, over and over. And uh, almost all of these can be looked at on the Reese Profile as opposite prioritizations of the same mode. So if two people, if you have one person's high on power and the other is low on power, they're going to quarrel over achievement, work, ambition. The high-powered parent may be ambitious, the low-powered 
the low power child is laid back. And so the parent will keep complaining to the child, you know, you don't work hard enough, you don't achieve. Self-hugging causes misunderstanding, it makes people angry. When you have a uh, misunderstanding, like a, on a work situation, uh, you know, you don't understand why somebody is disorganized or why somebody comes late to work. You think, oh, that person's coming late to work. They're being disrespectful to me. And it may just be that they just value spontaneity. And, uh, and if you understood that, it would diffuse the anger that, that arises from the from misunderstandings. This means that the risk profile is very relevant to conflict resolution. Conflict resolutions that work uh, in, in, uh, in a marriage, also in marriage therapy. So those are the three pillars of the risk profile. We define motives and purpose based on what people say, not based on what we imagine goes together. We have a concept of prioritization. We we have the idea that motives come and go. And that there's extraordinary individuality at the rates at which that happens. And that that tells us what the personality is. We can infer personality traits from risk profile, from motive. We can infer sometimes motives from personality. No one else knows how to do that. No one else has, has the principle. And then uh, the ideas of self-hugging in everyday charity, allow us to talk about uh, relationships. Okay, that's what makes it unique. Maya Briggs doesn't have these assumptions. MMBI doesn't have these assumptions. Big Five doesn't have any any of these assumptions. Or right? that's that's what we do that that is different. And our experience is increasingly that it leads empowers us to understand people in a unique way and to predict much better than a lot of other methods what people will do and it gives us a new way of intervening of trying to help by understanding what they're trying to do. It is amazing to me that other people, you know, and I used to do this too, try to understand another person without ever looking at what they're trying to do.